Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, my name is Kristen Bonio. I'm from Emory, and I'm going to round out this session on TNM staging, uh, talking with, about the larynx and hypopharynx. Uh, nothing to disclose, and I want to thank the Rankin Ray Society and Dr. Shaw for this invitation to speak with you today. So by the end of the next 20 minutes, I hope you're going to become familiar with the staging and patterns of spread of laryngeal and hypopharyngeal cancer. And we're going to focus on identifying findings that we're going to upstage the patient or change their management. So as as with other primaries um, uh, that we've discussed here in this session, 95% of malignancies of the larynx and hypopharynx are squamous cell carcinoma, and most of these are closely associated with tobacco and alcohol use. These cancers are seen five times more frequently in men than women, and the incidence increases with age over 55. So the larynx and hypopharynx are essential for functions such as breathing, swallowing, and speech. And as such, tumors in these locations and their treatment are associated with a really high morbidity and mortality. Treatment is aimed at a balance between patient survival and functional outcomes, and when possible, laryngeal conservation, often with chemo and radiation therapy, is the goal. Precise evaluation of the extent of these tumors is really imperative, and imaging plays a crucial role in accurate staging, management, and treatment selection, all of which is really best performed in a multidisciplinary setting, as we've discussed on prior, um, in, in, during the session. Um, also, in prior lectures in this, ses this session, we've discussed using the eighth edition of the AJCC to discuss the up-to-date staging of these tumors. So for staging these tumors, as with other primary sites, the mucosal extent of tumor is best determined clinically. So it's really important to read the clinical notes and look at pictures that may be in the chart. But the endoscopist can't see the submucosal extent, and that's where we come in and why cross-sectional imaging in these patients is so important. Knowing the pattern to spread for different subsites can help you detect subtle findings that can upstage your tumor and help you detect nodal spread. So we found, uh, as in other, um, in other primaries, CT is really the best for initial evaluation and staging. It's less affected by respiratory motion of the larynx, but also um, cheap and fast. Um, however, MRI is often helpful in the setting of assessing thyroid cartilage involvement, and PET can be helpful to detect regional nodal disease and distant disease um, in initial staging for advanced tumors. But remember, it can overstage the primary site uh, due to phonation and, and uptake during the um, uh, phonation during the uptake phase. So first, we're going to focus on T staging the primary cancers of the larynx. Remember, the larynx is divided into superglottic, glottic, and subglottic larynx. And staging tumors, especially when small, is really based on the site of origin. So you first have to determine where the tumor originated. And then the next step is to describe the mucosal extent of tumor. Does it extend beyond the larynx into the hypopharynx or oropharynx? And then the submucosal extent of tumor? Is there invasion of the preepiglottic or paraglottic spaces? And finally, is there cartilage invasion or extension beyond the larynx? So we're going to start with the different subsites of the larynx, starting with the supraglottic larynx. And just a bit of an anatomy reminder, remember that the supraglottic larynx extends from the tip of the epiglottis and A-fold superiorly down to the laryngeal ventricle inferiorly. On axial imaging, you note that you're in the supraglottic larynx when you can see the preepiglottic and paraglottic fat, as in this imaging at the level of the AE folds, and here um, lower at the level of the false cords. The preepiglottic fat is important to assess on any patient with a laryngeal tumor, and it's seen best on both axial and sagittal planes. Remember that this space contains normal vasculature and lymphatics, which is why advanced laryngeal tumors that involve this space have a worse prognosis and are upstaged and often present with nodal metastasis. More inferior and laterally at the level of the supraglottic larynx in the false focal folds, the preepiglottic fat becomes contiguous with the paraglottic fat uh, as it wraps around the thyroarytenoid muscle of the true vocal folds. Um, and um, this is best seen uh, in the coronal and the axial planes. Supraglottic primary tumors make up 30% of all laryngeal tumors and typically present relatively later than glottic tumors as they often present with pain or difficulty swallowing and often don't cause hoarseness until later in the disease. And as such, up to 35% of these can have nodal disease at presentation, as in this case of a circumferential supraglottic tumor with paraglottic space involvement and bilateral level three lymph nodes. The AJCC divides the supraglottic larynx into the following subsites the suprahyoid and infrahyoid portion of the epiglottis, uh, the AE folds, and arytenoids, and uh, the false focal folds. And so we're going to go into these in a little bit more detail. So here is the AJCC T staging for supraglottic larynx. This is taken from a really helpful staging manual that was actually created by Dr. Glastonbury. We actually have each of these for each subsite laminated and printed out in our reading room for reference, and I highly recommend you do that. 
um, you'll see that T1 tumors are limited to one subsite, whereas T2 tumors involve more than one subsite of the supraglottic larynx or tumors that extend beyond the supraglottic larynx um, that is still like to the base of tongue, et cetera. But without fixation of the larynx, once the, um, the vocal cords are fixed and paralyzed or there's preepiglottic or paraglottic space invasion or intercortex thyroid cartilage invasion, the tumor is upstage to T3. And if the tumor invades through the outer cortex of the thyroid cartilage or is extra laryngeal involving the soft tissues of the neck or extrinsic tongue muscles, uh, the tumor is stage T4A. T4B tumors are reserved for those that are rare tumors that are deemed unresectable with prevertebral space involvement, carotid encasement, or extension into the mediastinum. So to summarize, really one should look for one or more subsite of involvement. If there's more than one sub supraglottic subsite, it's at least a T2 tumor. The rest of the criteria are the same for any other laryngeal primary tumors. If the vocal cords are fixed, it's going to be a T3 tumor. If there's preepiglottic, paraglottic fat involvement or intercortex of the thyroid cartilage erosion, it's at least a T3 tumor. If there's extra laryngeal tumor extension or outer cortex thyroid cartilage involvement, it's a T4A tumor. And then again, uh, prevertebral space involvement, encasement of the carotid or extension of the mediastinum is considered T4B disease. So we're going to look at the subsites of the supraglottic larynx in more detail, starting with the suprahyoid or free edge of the epiglottis. And tumors here have a tendency to spread anteriorly via the hyoepiglottic ligament towards the base of tongue or vallecula. This ligament is a relative barrier to the involvement of the uh, or invasion of the preepiglottic fat or space. However, as a tumor progresses, it certainly can extend in there. Laterally, tumors extend along the pharyngoepiglottic fold to the lateral pharyngeal wall and then can extend extra larynx through the thyrohyoid membrane. Um, inferiorly, tumors can extend um, mucosally along the AE fold or down to the fixed portion of the epiglottis to become transglottic. Here's an example of an advanced superglottic tumor that started at the free edge of the epiglottis and extended anteriorly along the hyoepiglottic ligament into the molecular base of tongue with a little bit of infiltration into the extrinsic tongue muscles um, and as well as infiltration of the preepiglottic fat and involvement of the fixed portion of the epiglottis as well. Tumor also extended laterally along the pharyngoepiglottic fold to involve the lateral pharyngeal wall, but didn't quite get extra laryngeal at this point. However, this tumor is um, staged T4A due to the involvement of the extra, uh, extrinsic tongue muscles. Um, so it's not extra laryngeal, the level of the thyrohyoid membrane, but it does infiltrate into the base of tongue. And this is really important to mention because this patient, if they are candidate for surgical resection, um, they may require a total glossectomy as well as a total laryngectomy. So very important to mention. Moving on to tumors involving the infrahyoid or fixed portion of the epiglottis. Um, these tumors more easily spread into the preepiglottic fat with early extension uh, inferiorly along the pedial, which is another term for the base of the infrahyoid epiglottis and its attachment with the thyroid cartilage. Um, the, uh, as the tumors extend inferiorly, it can extend down to the anterior commissure of the true vocal folds. And um, remember the site of the attachment for the anterior true vocal folds where it attaches to the thyroid cartilage is called Boreal's ligament. And that's a spot that's relatively devoid of perichondrium and therefore susceptible to early uh, and relatively easy thyroid cartilage invasion. So these tumors can creep down and get outside the larynx that way. Tumors can come laterally and inferiorly and extend along the AE folds down to the false cords and glottic larynx. So here's an example of a tumor that started along the right fixed portion of the epiglottis. You can see that it's definitely infiltrating into the right preepiglottic fat, automatically making this a T3 tumor and extending inferiorly to the anterior glottic larynx at the level of the anterior commissure, but we don't see extra laryngeal tumor. Um, so this remains a T3 primary tumor. Moving on to tumors involving the AE folds. Um, these tumors often spread anteriorly into the paraglottic fat and laterally into the pier or posteriorly into the piriform sinus. Um, tumors in this location um, are considered marginal tumors because the AE fold divides the supraglottic larynx anteriorly from the piriform sinus and hypopharynx posteriorly. And sometimes it can be difficult to determine where these tumors originated from. I find it helpful to focus on the sort of the center of the tumor as they get bigger. And if the center is kind of more posterior, or certainly if there's significant cartilage invasion, or if it's wrapping around the posterior uh, thyroid ala, um, I would definitely favor a piriform sinus primary tumor in that setting. And then finally, tumors originating from the false focal folds have a propensity 
opportunity for early spread into the adjacent paraglottic fat, which becomes a, tie, a kind of a highway for tumor spread. And tumors can then easily extend to etrolaryngeal through the thyroid hyoid membrane, and then also extend, become transglottic pretty easily and extend through the laryngeal ventricle, even uh, causing a post-obstructive uh, laryngocele. And here's an example of a superglottic tumor centered in the region of the false focal fold, where you can see a tumor extension into that paraglottic fat um, and uh, obliteration of the laryngeal ventricle on the right compared to the left, so uh, in this transglottic tumor. So moving on to tumor originating from the glottic larynx, remember the glottic larynx is at the level of the true vocal cords, and you know you're at the glottic larynx when you see the linearity of the true vocal cords, which is made up primarily by the thyroretinoid muscle. Um, you don't, you lose that paraglottic fat at this level, and then you often can see all three cartilages in one plane, the retinoid, cricoid, and thyroid cartilage. Um, in the coronal plane, the glottic larynx is approximately one centimeter um, from the uh, upper surface of the true vocal cord or from the level of the laryngeal ventricle in craniocaudal extent. So glottic laryngeal tumors make up 60% of laryngeal primary tumors and typically present early with hoarseness. Um, there's a relative paucity of lymphatics and so, uh, and due to their early presentation, less than 10% of patients present with nodal disease. Small T1 tumors, as in this case of a small left uh, tree vocal fold tumor, are typically treated with surgical resection or radiation alone and have a really good uh, survival rate. But once tumors are T3 invading the paraglottic fat, these tumors, these patients are often treated with a combination of chemo and radiation um, versus occasional um, partial laryngectomy surgeries. And then historically, once the tumor is stage T4A, they can, uh, they most often require total laryngectomy, although some centers will still attempt um, laryngeal conservation therapy and select patients with early T4A disease. Uh, glottic tumors have, can spread a variety of directions. Anterior tumors have a tendency to spread across that anterior commissure and associated with early cartilage invasion and extra laryngeal spread like we discussed earlier, as in this patient with a right and anterior uh, commissure tumor coming out into the strap muscles. Transglottic tumors can spread posteriorly into the hypopharynx, as in this tumor, which is in the left paraglottic fat, eroding the left arytenoid cartilage, um, widening the left thyroid arytenoid gap. You can see it's displacing the arytenoid cartilage compared to the contralateral side and extending submucosally into the hypopharynx. And then tumor, as, of course, can extend inferiorly into the subglottic larynx, as in in this case, a tumor extending anteriorly into the subglottic larynx. Remember, any soft tissue in the airway at the level of the cricoid cartilage is considered abnormal, but sometimes it can be difficult to determine the inferior extent of subglottic tumor in patients that have uh, required tracheostomy, as in this patient, where the trach is actually extending out all the way into the inferior aspect of the tumor. Um, here's a chart, again, delineating the T-staging for glottic cancer, and really it's T1 and T2 primaries that are different from other laryngeal primaries. Um, so T1 tumor is limited to the true vocal folds with normal vocal cord mobility. If it only involves one cord, it's T1A. If it involves both vocal folds, it's T1B. Once it extends to superglottic or subglottic larynx, it's T2 tumor. Or if there's vocal cord paresis, it's a T2 tumor. And then again, similar to the other glottic tumors, if the vocal cord's fixed, if there's preepiglottic or paraglottic fat invasion, inner cortex of the thyroid cartilage, it's at least T3. Um, and then you look for extra laryngeal spread or outer cortex, um, uh, thyroid cortex uh, invasion, it's T4A. And then of course the findings that make it unresectable. Uh, here's a case of a large glottic transglottic primary laryngeal malignancy centered in the left hemilarynx, extending cranially to the left area of the glottic fold within the left paraglottic space, along the left true vocal fold, extending to the anterior commissure and extending laterally through and through the thyroid cartilage uh, into the strap muscles um, with both erosion and sclerosis of the left thyroid cartilage, as well as uh, sclerosis of the left arytenoid and the cricoid cartilage with subglottic extension of tumor. And this tumor, this patient was a T4A um, primary uh, glottic tumor. So this leads us to the subject of cartilage invasion, which is really important to detect both the extent and the depth of cartilage involvement as it can alter the stage and treatment plan. Transcartilaginous extralaryngeal tumor can place a patient at increased risk for recurrence as well as non-functional larynx due to chondronecrosis after, oops, after laryngeal conservation with chemo and radiation and therefore treatment is often surgery with total laryngectomy. Detection of cartilage invasion can be difficult because cartilage has a really variable ossification from patient to patient, but also from side to side. So typically on CT, you look for direct tumor extension, ex 
tension through the cartilage and erosion with uh, ideally with tumor on both sides of the cartilage um, to, to be the most specific indicator of uh, cartilage penetration. Sclerosis in isolation is sensitive, but not specific for involvement with tumor and only predicts tumor involvement in about 50% of the time as reactive edema in the adjacent uh, cartilage can also cause sclerosis. So MR can be even more sensitive for cartilage involvement. And I find it really helpful for problem solving in some cases, but you have to be careful because you can overcall tumor involvement. Again, reactive changes in the cartilage can lead to false positives. Typically, you really want to look for abnormal signal within the cartilage that's ISO intense to be adjacent to or on all sequences, whereas reactive edema is typically more enhancing and more T2 hyper intense than the adjacent tumor. And then finally, many people um, uh, tout a dual energy CT as being really helpful for problem solving. We don't really use it at our institution much, but the iodine overlay maps are associated with increased specificity um, uh, in assessing for enhancement within the cartilage. So here's a case that demonstrates the potential utility of MRI. You can see this large anterior glottic tumor with a broad interface with the irregularly ossified and intermittently sclerotic laryngeal cartilage bilaterally. And when you look at the fat planes with the strap muscles, it can be really kind of hard to tell, um, so especially since it's bilateral, if there's extra laryngeal tumor. Um, but MRI shows enhancement in T2 signal within the cartilage and outside the cartilage that's iso intense to the adjacent tumor, compatible cartilage penetration and T4A disease, which was confirmed pathologically. Um, you can compare that case with this case as it's a possible false positive where the signal in the adjacent thyroid cartilage is hyper intense to the adjacent tumor, compatible with reactive edema, therefore not involved, and this tumor remains uh, T3. So in addition to transcartilaginous extralaryngeal spread of laryngeal tumor, um, tumor extending out through the larynx uh, or, or tumor extending posteriorly through the thyroid space or cranially to the base of tongue, like we've discussed, uh, remember, uh, two other important common pathways of extralaryngeal spread of tumor is sort of um, by tumor taking the path of least resistance through the thyroid or hyoid membrane, um, both anteriorly in the subglottic larynx and laterally, um, or um, in the, I'm sorry, supraglottic larynx, or in the subglottic larynx extending um, through the cricothyroid membrane. And but all of these can upstage a patient to T4A disease. So uh, we already showed, here's another case of transcartilaginous extralaryngeal spread T4A disease into the strap muscles. And again, this case that we showed earlier, posterior extension into the hypopharynx through the thyroid space. But here's a patient uh, with superglottic uh, laryngeal tumor extending out laterally through the thyroid membrane into the soft tissues of the neck. Uh, so this is another patient with T4A disease. And then finally, here's a rare case of a patient with uh, T4B disease, pre-vertubal muscle involvement, a very large laryngeal and hypopharyngeal tumor um, with extensive extralaryngeal spread where you can see loss of the fat planes with the right pre-vertubal musculature on the right um, compared to the left. Um, pre-vertubal muscle involvement really is best determined clinically at the time of surgery, but should be mentioned if you're suspected and MRI can be helpful in these cases. And then finally, subglottic laryngeal cancer is pretty rare. Only 10% of primary laryngeal malignancies, often large at presentation, requiring laryngectomy and adjuvant radiation. Um, and subglottic larynx is relatively alymphatic, so less than 20% present with uh, metastatic disease. Um, staging of these tumors is similar to other primary sites. If it's confined to the subglottic larynx, it's T1. If it comes to the vocal cords with normal or mildly impaired mobility, it's T2. Again, once the vocal cord is fixed or if the paraglottic fat or inner cortex of the cartilage is eroded, it's T3. But more commonly, if there's cricoid cartilage invasion or extra laryngeal spread through the cricothyroid membrane, it's T4A. Um, and here's a case of subglottic tumor with um, uh, extension through the cricothyroid membrane, extending into the extra laryngeal soft tissues, T4A. And remember that they can also extend posteriorly through the cricoid into the post cricoid hypopharynx and cervical esophagus. And that sort of leads us into the hypopharynx. Um, again, the hypopharynx is posterior to the larynx, essentially the verge of the cervical esophagus, separated by the AE folds and extends inferiorly to the inferior margin of the cricoid cartilage. The subsites of the P's, the piriform sinus out laterally, the post cricoid mucosa anteriorly, and the posterior pharyngeal wall posteriorly. And these cancers really do have the worst prognosis of all head and neck cancers, usually really large at presentation with nodal meds. Um, I think of the T-staging of the hypopharynx sort of as a combination of oropharynx and supraglottic larynx using both size and extent to help stage. So T1 tumors are limited to one subsite and, uh, and or um, uh, less, I'm sorry, um, smaller than, greater, lesser than or equal to um, two centimeters. 
centimeters in greatest dimension. Um, T2 tumors are more than one subside or between two to four centimeters. And then once the vocal cord is fixed or the tumor is greater than four centimeters, it's T3. And again, T4A and T4B tumors are similar to other advanced laryngeal tumors. Piriform sinus is the most common site of hypopharyngeal tumors. And when small, it can be difficult to pick up both radiographically and clinically and can present as a call primary, as in this case with a necrotic level two nodal mass. This initially, this uh, small T1 primary uh, piriform sinus was missed, but then easily picked up on PET. So the PET can be helpful in this setting. These tumors can spread laterally and become really large and extend through and around the thyroid cartilage into the soft tissues of the neck and also extend anteriorly into the larynx. Um, post cricoid um, uh, tumors, uh, those tumors that involve the anterior hypopharynx are not very common, often erode the adjacent cricoid cartilage and extend anteriorly into the posterior commissure region um, and inferiorly into the esophagus. And then and posterior pharyngeal wall tumors are pretty uncommon, um, but they can spread posteriorly to the retropharyngeal space in prevertebral fascia and are often associated with retropharyngeal lymphadenopathy, as is really any hypopharyngeal tumor or any tumor involving the posterior pharyngeal wall. So you really want to look for these because this can um, change management. They can be easily missed if you don't look for retropharyngeal nodes. Um, these are not included in a typical neck dissection and, and can also change the treatment field for radiation. So really important to detect those. So speaking of lymphadenopathy, most lymphadenopathy associated with laryngeal and hypopharyngeal tumors involve levels two through four. And in addition uh, to retropharyngeal nodes, occasionally you can see these little delphian nodes anteriorly uh, at the level of the cricothyroid membrane or just above. Um, and these can be important to mention as they may also not be included in a typical neck dissection or radiation field, more commonly seen with tumors that extend into the subglottic larynx. Um, nodal staging, I'm not gonna go into, it's very similar to all the other non-HPV, non-EBV squamous cell, and again, remember um, N3B disease is the new uh, distinction with AJCC8, where you see overt extranodal extension of tumor. And then finally, M staging is important in the setting laryngeal and hypopharyngeal tumors. Um, pulmonary METs can be seen in up to 10% of advanced laryngeal tumors. And remember, mediastinal lymphadenopathy is considered distant disease, but you can um, often see um, sort of a pitfall in PET imaging when you have patients with um, laryngectomies or tracheostomies. Um, they can have tracheal inflammation that can cause a little bit of uptake in the, these nodes. So it's important to look at both morphology and FDG uptake. So in summary, accurate interpretation of imaging is really critical for accurate staging and management of these tumors. Um, for small tumors, it really depends on the subsite and it's important to define the extent of tumor um, and really rely on the clinical notes to help you and understanding the patterns of tumor spread can really help you. And remember, um, there are um, some uh, features that are similar to all laryngeal and hypopharyngeal tumors. And if you're ever unsure about extra laryngeal tumor or thyroid cartilage invasion, uh, MRI can be helpful. So thank you so much all for your time and attention. I'm sorry that was a quite a bit, but I appreciate your, um, if, please feel free to contact me with any questions. All right, thank you everybody for uh, hanging in there uh, and listening to this uh, session on head and neck cancer staging. Um, we've got one question, which I think is for me. Um, which MR sequence is optimal for visualizing sinus of Morgagni defects? Um, so I think the coronal pre-contrast T1 um, is gonna be the best way to detect uh, tumor sort of spilling out into that very superior most aspect of that parapharyngeal space right below the skull base. So, you know, what you can expect to see is, you know, clean parapharyngeal space uh, fat up to, 
you know, maybe five millimeters or so below the skull base and then typically unilaterally loss of the expected uh, fat signal. So, you know, head neck radiologists love uh, pre-contrast T1 weighted imaging. We use fat as our uh, natural contrast agent. And I think this is a, a great setting. Anything in and around the parapharyngeal space um, is, is really well depicted on pre-contrast uh, T1 weighted imaging and the coronal plane is the best for looking at this, this small area just below the skull base. So I think that is the last question. Um, so I will once again, thank you all uh, for attending this uh, session and uh, enjoy the rest of this uh, virtual ARRS meeting. Thank you.